And I remember her saying, okay, you're going to play Mr. Sin today. And she hands me this purple puppet with a nasty mustache. Pop little puppet up. And literally on cue, 80 kids out there all, boo, no, yuck, I hate that guy. I was like, man, these guys are trained on cue. Like, I don't know if they got candy for doing that or what. But. Oh, man, they just want to come down on someone. Deep theological teaching. Deep theological uh, teaching. Well. Hey everyone, welcome to Together We Build with Chris and Prudence. My name is Chris. I'm going to be your host today with her. And I'm and your hostess cupcake. And your hostess cupcake. They can't hear you when you're that far away from the mic. Well, I... <clears throat> there. That's fantastic. So just like many of these episodes, my job is to draw out her incredible brilliance. And then also throw in color commentary that's humorous. That's my job. So... Um, I forgot to start our timer, so hopefully we'll remember exactly how long this has gone. Okay, so we are going to go after something I think that's going to be amazing. This is going to be the first of probably a two-part series where we dig into the book of Nehemiah. If you're not familiar with the book of Nehemiah, it is absolutely fantastic. It's one of my favorites. I feel like it's a manual for leadership in business, but I also feel like depending on where you are, it's going to be a manual for you. Like you could literally be a stay at home parent. You could be a fortune 10 CEO. You could be a minister, pastor. You could be a grandma. You could be a 16 year old kid. It's what like, a clown? you could be a clown. You could literally be a clown. In fact, if you're a clown, please put in the comments that I'm a clown proudly clowning around. And I love the book of Nehemiah also. So put that in the comments and you'll get a free prize. Okay. Um, but before we get to the book of Nehemiah, we need to do something. You know what it is? Is it the B or not the B? It's the B or not B. You ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, this has been one of those days where this is the, actually the third, is this the fourth take? Probably. You got, we got battery issues, we got streaming issues, we got server issues. Um, so, B or not B. Okay, let's let's tackle some of these. Okay. Be or not be. Now, the last take, you got 50% of them right. Mm -hmm. But that didn't get recorded. So you get a free try again. So Uh, do you think you can beat the take that didn't get recorded? uh, I got to do all new questions. I got to do all all new questions. Let's do it. Okay. Um, Okay. Be or not be. Spinach has been taught how to send emails. Spinach, you know, the stuff Popeye eats. Spinach. Spinach has been taught to send emails. Uh, Come on. Uh, be or not be. Let me read it one more time uh, and I know it's, 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 it's going to come to you. It's, it's going to come to you. Spinach is taught how to send emails. B it's got to be a true not headline. B. True? Yeah. Final answer. Yeah. 100% positive? Yeah. You are correct. Spinach is taught, has been taught how to send emails. This makes mm. me want to go read this, but this viral story, story has been reported in the Telegraph, Huffington Post, so you know it's trustworthy. Oh, boy. Um, okay. <laughs> My little jab. Uh, okay. Next one. B or B. So, so you're 100% so far. Okay. 100%. Um... Okay, B or not B. Schools remove analog clocks from exam halls as teenagers cannot tell time. Quote, unquote. Teenagers cannot tell time. Okay, let me read it again. Yeah. Um, schools are removing analog clocks um, from exam say... halls as teenagers cannot tell time. It's true. Uh, it's a real headline. It's true. Are you it's sure? A real headline. You. That's your final answer. Yeah. You are two for two. That is also a correct news headline. Mm-hmm. So that is scary. <laughs> that students cannot read. Okay. So it's like it's got the big hand, the little hand, the little hand is ours. The big. Okay. So. Gosh. Okay. This one is too good not to do. Um, B or not B. 
woman mistakes town hall meeting for Donald Trump rally and smears 30 cars with smooth peanut butter in protest. One more time. Woman mistakes town hall meeting for Donald Trump rally and smears 30 cars with smooth peanut butter to protest. It really seems like something an anti-Trumper would do. Yeah, it does. Actually, I'm going to go with it's a real headline. Oh, my goodness. You are three for three. Christina Ferguson, a 32-year-old woman in Wisconsin, was arrested last week after she was allegedly... 32? 32. You would think by 32, <laughs> she would know better. 32 years old um, after smearing what cars... A waste of peanut butter. <laughs> ...with peanut butter in an anti-Trump protest. So basically what happened is she thought it was a Trump rally, and it wasn't. It was a town hall meeting, and she was really angry about this supposed Trump rally which wasn't actually happening and so she got her peanut butter and smeared 30 so 30 cars like how much peanut butter is that that's a lot and I don't know like what was the even in tension of doing that like I just I can just see this whole thing like she pulls up she's like oh my goodness I hate these magas this these guys need to pay let's go to Costco and buy a pallet of peanut butter so they go and to Costco, they caught. buy a pallet, and then the police show up because she was arrested. So the police show up and she's like, you know, covered in peanut butter. She's like putting it on the cars. She's yeah, like I'm covered famous. in peanut butter. And she's I'm like, famous. I didn't do it. I, made it I, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. For smearing cars with peanut butter. Whenever you do an anti-Trump person, you do a Valley Girl yeah, accent. Well, it's the best I got. Oh, man. This is crazy. When officers from the Portage County Sheriff Department questioned Mrs. Ferguson, she claimed she hadn't left her apartment that night while allegedly licking her fingers repeatedly. (laughs) That is ridiculous. This sounds so (laughs) fake, but it's actually totally a real article. It might be fake news, but it's definitely a real article. Okay, so there wasn't any Babylon Bees in that. Wasn't any? No, let's do one more, though. Maybe it will be... A Babylon B. So you're three for three. You're three for three right now, and I have that. I can't even hardly believe it. You're three for three. Okay. Here we go. B or not B? Mm-hmm. Mattel unveils new pregnant Ken doll. Mattel, the toy ma- it's maker. It's got to be a true headline. Mattel, the toy maker, it's unveils be, new pregnant Ken doll. It's, it's a real news headline. Is that your final answer? Yeah. Unfortunately, that is a Babylon B. Oh, Yay. praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong. So they didn't release a uh, pregnant Ken doll, but they, Apple does now have a pregnant man emoji, yeah. which is, you know, so needed, by the way. So needed. Yeah. Like, I've been super offended. They haven't had a pregnant man uh, emoji I'm because sorry. I'm constantly I'm needing sorry, to say men. it. You can't have babies. You just can't. I mean, are you sure about that? Or I'm pretty sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's three, four, four. That's mm-hmm. 75%, which um, with today's new letter grading standards, that's an A plus with extra credit. All right. I'll take it. <laughs> I like getting A's. And you get a participation award. Good job. What's so. That? A golf clap? Yeah. Oh, that's very Listen, puny. listen, can you hear? That is the millions of people that watch this program all cheering for you in unison literally around the world right now. Listen. It's a lousy reward. Come on. All right. Fine. Let's just get on to Nehemiah. So um, I know you've got a little bit of commentary in your Bible here at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah. I think we should read that. If you're not familiar, the really quick snapshot is that Nehemiah... Um, was called by the Lord to go help rebuild a wall that had not been rebuilt in 60 years. And this story is basically how he accomplished that in an unbelievably short amount of time and what the strategy was around it. I, this is one of my absolute favorite books. It is so applicable to every part of every season of life that I found. So how we ended up with this little paper right here, which has tons of doodles on it, those, those are your doodles, Prudence, is that um, you got a be under your bonnet to write this well um i just i'm the mic i actually the mic man he's so pushy no don't move it it's loud when you do that it's fine it's fine Um, you're good you're good (laughs) 
So, uh, <laughs> how did we come to have this document? How did we come oh, to have yeah. this document? Well, uh, last week sometime, he had sent me a text because he was really upset about feeling like he had too much to do and too little of help. Wait, which, that's why you wrote, that's why you did this? Yeah. Oh, and so I, I my my Bible was actually open at the time when he um sent me that text and I found something in Nehemiah. I found a few different things that was applicable to helping encourage him to keep going. Yes. Um, Thank you. It was encouraging. But then I started like really doing some more exploration of the story and then ended up spending like the entire afternoon just going through and making points and comments and commentary on how um, this story is very relevant and the lessons that we can take away from it uh, as we build um, the Apostolic Resource Center here. Um, but also we feel like it is definitely applicable to businesses and your families and um, just when you're faced with a task where you just have too little time it feels like too little time not enough yeah. resources I mean I know you guys have people. never felt that way before um, where you had too, too many little tasks time. so that's kind of a, um, a, a, a feeling that we don't like to feel but unfortunately um, that's the way the cookie crumbles a lot of times and right now in um, our season it's uh, it's tough to get everything done especially yeah. for him yeah so. for sure so I I didn't know that that was the reason I thought it was because um, I uh, spoke on the Sunday before she did this and I referenced Nehemiah a couple times so I thought that you were inspired by my no that wasn't the case message but i mean it was a good message but I... <laughs> whatever it's fine let's just get into it so anyway let's read this first so the, this is a good okay, overview so uh, the books of ezra which comes right before nehemiah the books of ezra and nehemiah were originally one volume um but a guy named jerome this guy named Jerome back Not then. Not Kersey. In between 342 and 420 AD. He actually split them into Ezra 1 and 2 in the Vulgate. And that's not a Star Trek term. That's the name. <laughs> Welcome of to the, the Vulgate. Latin translation of the Bible. I read Latin. I read the Latin translation oh, no, every day with he my morning not. coffee. And not long afterward, the second portion was named Nehemiah after its principal character. So it really was Ezra 2, originally, is what you're saying. Um, well, no, they were, they were together. The stories were together. Right, and he broke it in half to Ezra 1 and 2, and then he made this yeah. Ezra 2 into Nehemiah. No, because we have Ezra 1 and 2. So we have Ezra 1 and 2 now and Nehemiah. We have Ezra 1 and 2? I thought yeah. it was Ezra, Nehemiah. Um, I think you're incorrect. Nehemiah became, as Ezra 2 became Nehemiah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It, it's it's written a little bit confusing Think here. back through to the okay, song so where you memorize right. the books of the I Bible. I see it right here. There is 66 Ezra books in the whole Bible. I should have caught that. Yeah, you definitely should have. Okay, so the name Nehemiah means Jehovah Comforts. And so um, Nehemiah was really concerned that the Lord's name was not being esteemed as it should have been mm. because the city of Jerusalem was in ruins. Mm -hmm. So he was Train wreck. Um, um, it down in the first chapter, it talks about um, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame mm -hmm. because its walls had been broken down and its gates were destroyed by fire. Yeah. So the it was kind of an embarrassing situation. Yes. And, you know, God's people um, should have been doing better than this. Yes. So basically these walls had been down. By the time Nehemiah went to rebuild them, about 60 years. Mm hmm Which is a bit. <clears throat> it's a bit. So Nehemiah um, actually was appointed governor of Judea by the Persian emperor. And then um, 
he uh, he actually um, got military escort and government funding from the king who was um, a he was a pagan king. He yeah. he didn't serve our, the Lord. Definitely a bad guy. Um, except for he was he supported Nehemiah. So, anyways, it talks about um, some um, artifact paper artifacts that uh, historical documents that um, confirm that this story um, is indeed truth hmm. and um, that's sweet. basically this story demonstrates that the Lord will sometimes use men who do not acknowledge him as the one true God to accomplish his purpose yeah come on so he he served under Nehemiah served under the heathen king, um, but God moved the king's heart so that he was willing to supply Nehemiah with the means to rebuild Jerusalem. So basically, Nehemiah approached the king, who um, was a bad dude. Actually, wasn't serving the Lord, didn't believe in God, wasn't wasn't part of God's kingdom, mm-hmm. and because of Nehemiah's service. They actually touched the heart of the king, and the king gave him full support, documents, financial support, military support. It was incredible. Nehemiah, uh, this is a a great example of a Christian being involved with the government Mm -hmm. and having found favor with the government officials that were not uh, following the Lord. Yes. So this is also applicable today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, our, so how is it applicable today? Well, lots of Christians may say we should have nothing to do with the government. We shouldn't work for them. We shouldn't be involved with them. I feel like that's a super common narrative. Like, hey, look, the government is not the church. The government is evil and bad, and we should not mix the two. We should not ever talk about government. We should not be in government. If you are in government, then just you know keep your head down and shut up and do your job and then get out and beg for forgiveness on Sunday. Like That's a lot of what the teaching that's out there is today. I mean, honestly, it's kind of a cop-out. It's definitely a cop-out, it's, it's and very it's definitely not biblical. Yeah. It's definitely not biblical. Nehemiah is a perfect example of someone that was working under a corrupt king. But he served the king anyway, and he served the Lord. And he did both. He didn't sacrifice his beliefs and morals and what God wanted to serve the correct corrupt king, but he served the corrupt king anyway. And in this story, it is very um, it is only possible what Nehemiah did because he had the favor of the king. But Nehemiah is not the only example. There's lots. Mm -hmm. Daniel, there's tons of really good examples of how important it is to have that relationship um, when possible Mm -hmm. with um, other leaders, government leaders and so forth. So the key is relationship here. Mm -hmm. Having good relationships. Seat at the table. Seat at the table. Seat at the table. um, But just really having favor with... um, people outside of your immediate circle and how do you get that favor you get that favor by serving them and there is almost always a way to remain in kingdom principle and serve someone that is not serving the kingdom Mm -hmm. so 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 what this document is here that i think we're going to go through again this is going to be a two-parter is basically a commentary that Prudence wrote. So it's got a a section where it talks about the verse, a little one-liner that kind of explains, based on her understanding and interpretation, what it's saying. And then for this particular document, a, a question, sometimes one or two questions, posed based on that passage from Nehemiah to the church today. So this is written from the church context, but we're also going to look at it from family or business context as well, because it is so universal, universally applicable. Mm-hmm. So I think we should just cl- crank through this thing. Let's do it. Okay. First so, point. Um, so oh, we've kind of been talking yeah, about the first so point. So it's, it's, it's important to have a uh, kingdom principles mm-hmm. being um, practiced within the government mountains. Yeah. And here you'll hear us talk a lot about the seven mountains. A lot of people don't like that Mm -hmm. i would ask you to think about that and (laughs) the absolute um ridiculousness that that is not 
um, kingdom yeah. mindset. I mean, this this isn't an episode about Seven Mountains. We'll, we'll definitely go into that for sure. But just at a 10,000, no, 100,000 foot flyby. So Seven Mountains is um, saying that there's seven major spheres or areas of influence in society. And that as Christians, we're actually called to go into those spheres. We're called into those. So every person is called into one or more of those areas to serve. And you basically really are. doing God's You're things really already God's way in, a sense in those. There. A lot of people don't like this because they co- they've labeled it dominionism. And then they That's say that lie. dominionism is bad. Um, and, and that um, what they believe that uh, a lot of the seven mountains teaching is actually asking is for us to go force people into Christianity. Um, just to s- make it super quick, kind of like the Crusades. Crusades were right. bad. Yeah, um, that they went is around not with what this knives is. and we're forcing people, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's not what this is. No. This is saying that we've all been given assignments in a different areas of society. And if we take God's principles right out of this book right here into just those like areas Nehemiah of society, just Esther, like Nehemiah did and Esther and, and, Daniel. and Daniel and all these guys, then, um, then we will be able to move the needle so to speak uh, in that area or that mountain or that sphere of society with a god principled effect Mm -hmm. so you know ultimately this is about doing things god's way we talk god's about will, having god's way. a light that shines yeah. well how are you gonna have a light that shines if you're not you're shining not. it i remember it went like this hide it under a bushel no yeah except i'm gonna let it shine it seems like the bushel way is pe- the bushel way the bushel. idea of, of being mm. safe and staying yeah. away from the world yeah so we need to get out of that um mm-hmm. i if you need to look no further than the people that say i just don't understand why the world's getting so bad yeah. over here and then over here they say dude don't fall into this dominionism teaching okay mm-hmm. you need to be focused only on the church and that's what Christianity is, is hiding in the church. So no, anyways, the there is, is the people and the people live in the world. There are multiple the church must together. We build episodes that can be done on seven mountains, but this isn't mm, that one. This no, is on Nehemiah. No, so let's press just on. Had to, but this is a part of the point about being it's super, super relevant, super relevant government. And, and that let me ask you this. Uh, let me ask you this prudence. Mm-hmm. As you went through this, do you feel Nehemiah would have been written in this um, historical document created if ne- Nehemiah did not have favor with the government? Well, the answer is no, obviously. I I'm mean, going for a no I here. I suppose that the Lord could miraculously have risen up the way tools that, and things. Yes, out of what I'm going for, <laughs> you just completely destroyed where I was going. What I'm going for is the, the reality is Nehemiah could not have done this in this way without the support of this corrupt government. And he yeah. didn't sacrifice any of his morals, beliefs, or God's ways story came about. to get it. This is, yeah. So, so okay, let's keep right. going. So, let's see. Are we on two now? Uh, oh, it looks like I made two number ones. Okay, so, um, so even though Nehemiah had gotten the permission slips and the all the permits and the paperwork and everything and started distributing them amongst all of the other governors in the area and and such um telling them what was happening and what he was granted permission for um he immediately ran into opposition yeah of a, a guy so you're saying he didn't get a free pass well yeah i mean it would have been nice, but there's always going to be opposition, right? There's always um, opposition. Especially if you're doing something that's um, really serving the Lord. And, mm-hmm. um, so this fellow, I think you say the Sambala. Is that how I, you say I, that? I have always said it, Sambalot, but I don't know if that's true. No. I don't know. We're going to go with that, and we're going to say it with confidence because I think biblical names, people just always think you're saying it right if you say it with total confidence. Okay. So anyway, unless you're not sure how to say Job or something, he had some other buddies that he eventually stirred up, and um, they started immediately discouraging them from. They were the the naysayers. They were the naysayers. 
Yes, they were definitely the naysayers. And um, so the devil wasted no time. As soon as the news for the Jews to build back their wall uh, was uh, known, they immediately started in with their very first evil gig. Evil a gig. Evil gig. And uh, actually made a list it's of their very all first evil of gig. the things that they tried. We've got an evil gig list at the end. <laughs> um, so, yeah, th- this one was really uh, very, like, laughing and scorning and just really, like, how dare you think that you're going to do this type of attitude. Kind of a mocking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the first question is, is like, um, who is doing that to the project that we're building currently, you know, those are, well, in my mind, that's relatives of the Sambalot, you know, how, how ridiculous for us to think that we could build something so large or, um, like, um, I don't know. Grand. Grand. Yeah, because there's a big grand plan for that, and it, it is, like, super overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so. so so, so if I could summarize this up, or we're never going to get through even two episodes, um, for this first point, basically you're saying that even though he had total favor with the government, had a stamp of approval from the king, he still immediately had opposition. Mm-hmm. And then what's your question? Where, where do you have the question written? And so when you're in the process of building something that seems overwhelming, like even when Noah was building the ark and it seemed just ridiculous to the general people around him. Um, but in this case, it was the, it was the wall of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, you know, what is it that you are working on or like is in your future that just seems super overwhelming and hard to get to yeah and people are laughing and scorning at that yeah absolutely saying that's ridiculous how dare you think you can do that yep so basically we're always going to be faced with opposition like no matter how much favor we have there'll be opposition for sure so um so then nehemiah he didn't just you know shut up and and take the scorn which i think is interesting he he spoke back to them and uh, on a few different occasions in this uh, story and um to he said so they get busy and they're saying what is this thing that you are doing are you rebelling against the king you get this little snarky attitude in there, basically like, I'm going to go tell the king on you <laughs> on what you're doing, <laughs> you know? Um, and then Nehemiah was like, you know what? The God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants will arise and build. Yeah. That's um, good. But you are not having any of this. That's right. <laughs> You're out. I love so this. So if you think that you're going to, you know, come in and have a spot, mm-mm. I love the way that you asked this question. This is the question posed <clears throat> to the church. Is it necessary to speak up and rebuke those it who is. try? Oh, that's what I said. That's what, that's what I said. It is necessary to speak up and rebuke those who try and slather us with the slime of discouragement. Yeah. That's good. And this to meet it with bad news. to meet it with the confidence that, you know what, God is for us and if this is his plan and will, he's going to make it happen. It, you can just keep your discouragement to yourself and go yeah. enjoy it in your own picnic lunch somewhere else. Yeah, this, that's yeah. not around here. So, um, um Anyway, so he really followed it up with the confidence. And um, he, he led the charge for the people. He held that confidence for, that pe- for the people. And um, d- it didn't seem to be really discouraged, you know? Because mm-hmm. um, God will work 
with us and do what seems impossible with us. So. Yeah, that's so good. All right, let's move to so, point number yeah, three. So we got to we gotta move. Getting together their people and they didn't have a lot of people and they didn't have a lot of the, the people, skilled people to really uh, like construction workers. So did you skip over the part where he evaluated the damage? Yeah, I did. Okay, I well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back to that real quick. So one of the things that I feel like is critically important is when Nehemiah first got there, he surveyed the situation. And, he, and then he, he did a thorough survey of everything, that, the problems. He did not ignore them. He, he saw them. In fact, he went to the leaders and he said, look at the trouble that we're in, which is kind of an important point because he wasn't, he didn't even live there. Like he wasn't really in trouble, but he went there on assignment from the Lord, put himself in that position. And even though he could have left and the it would have been fine with him in his life, but he put himself into that situation. He said, look at the trouble that we're in. So I think this is important because a lot of times today, I feel like people think radical faith means pretending like there are no problems. God will take care of everything. Don't worry. There's no problems. No. There is Nehemiah problems. surveyed the situation on purpose, did not deny a single issue, but at the same time, believed the truth of God's promise that he was going to rebuild the wall. So he didn't let the fact that it had been 60 years unbuilt waver his faith. He didn't let the fact that the wall was complete shambles and they were being attacked regularly by their enemies sway him from having the faith, but he didn't deny that those things were real either. Yeah. So he, um, yeah. So acknowledgement that there is issues and problems is you can't, how are you going to fix it if you don't acknowledge that there's a problem? And, um, I mean, I think that probably a lot of these officials and nobles, they already saw it, but didn't have a strategy to to get it put yeah. out of, you know, yeah, get rid of that problem. For sure, for sure. All right, I'm going to keep this thing moving. There was specific delegation and responsibility for each family. The clans came together and each claimed a piece of the wall they were responsible for and went to work to help build back better. <laughs> the original <laughs> campaign promise. Clear I'm back sorry. to Nehemiah. Just... <laughs> Shame on. <laughs> it just seems oh. like it. Uh... <laughs> Let me reread this. Um, the clans came together and each claimed a piece of the wall they were responsible for, and they went to work to help build back better. They shared <laughs> in the workload. It sounds like there was a blueprint of action they followed. Women were working along with the men. Priests were working as well. So yeah. I love this. I feel like this is such a great example of, okay, so here's the, here's the pivotal piece. Each claimed a piece of the wall they were responsible for and went to work to help build it back better, to help, to help yeah. rebuild the wall. That is so, so important. So they, they really, um, they used everyone. And it wasn't just like a team of construction workers that were skilled. I mean, these people there were perfumers in here that yep. were rebuilding it was everybody um that was they everybody. specialized that was their what they specialized in was making perfumes yeah and yet here they were getting their hands dirty and yes. um doing things that they didn't normally Absolutely. do to make sure that the job got done and like so many things this reminds me a story of elon musk so you might not know this, you probably don't, but in the history of Tesla, which is uh, one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable car company in the world now, um, just a few years ago, they were literally one week from bankruptcy. Like they were seven days or maybe it was nine days. I think it was nine days, nine days from bankruptcy. And Elon Musk said, I want every single person, every single person, every engineer, janitor, C, you know, CFO, accountant, every single person to get on the phone. Here's the list of anyone that has ever expressed interest in a Tesla. I want you to get on the phone and try to sell them a car. And they literally activated every single employee in the company. And only because they were all working together, they were able to sell enough vehicles in that nine days 
to avoid going to bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So, but this is a great picture of what our church community should be. Mm. Where we're all taking a piece. We're all taking a piece. Selling the cars. We're all doing a little something to contribute to building that wall. Every some some church communities may have different types of walls that they're building, but there should be some something that they're working on together. Yeah. Um, that pulls everyone together and and. Um, uh, this is really where we are right now and our church community is trying to get everyone to be putting some elbow grease into something because yeah, it's really all absolutely. hands on deck all hands on deck to make I, this happen i love the way you wrote this here prudence i'm going to read it every family took part in this project teamwork helped make the dream work i know you didn't come up with that but um, they all understood they had parts to play although they brought different skills to the table they were working on a foundational blueprint that paved the way for their different skills and talents to be carried out in safety but first it was necessary to work on the foundation together if they did not have that, they could not thrive and blossom in their individuality. In other words, if you're later on, you have a skill to do this one particular thing, but and that's great, and you're going to get to that. But right now, we got to build the foundation mm -hmm. first. Yep. And then here's the question that you pose: Does our community, or for you, does your community know that all hands are needed to build? Like, are you in a season where everyone's needed needed to build, and do they know the part that they're supposed to play? Yeah. That, that is... A, That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. One that you should answer. Yes. All right, let's and go on to number four. Why don't you read that one? Uh, a loud-mouthed opposition was happening from Sambalot again. He was stirring up his own people and then a whole different enemy army. He was just out there just collecting them all just to really rally people against uh, the rebuilding of the wall. Mm -hmm. um, Tobiah from a different people group was also on board to cause trouble and they were just laughing and poking fun and just really like rumor rumorville was happening like they were just uh, they were just stirring up others and uh, the trouble was loud and it went far. And, um, you know, how does that look in today's day and age? <laughs> like what we're dealing with all the time. <laughs> I mean, constantly people complaining and whining. I and mean, our own <laughs> establishment here got put into the local newspaper as they were. Busy. That usually means you're doing something good. Yeah, I exactly. Because they were busy trying to rip up conservative candidates in our area. Mm. So they were pointing out that they were affiliated here with these Captain and Sanos in their eyes. And also it was held at this establishment in church. And, you know, I looked at that and I'm like, ha, we must have arrived. That's kind <laughs> of a cute laugh. <laughs> here comes the opposition yeah, in I the think, media. I think this is a good juxtaposition <laughs> with the first point, which is it's super important to develop relationships with people. It's super important to develop relationships with your leaders. But at the same time, you have to stand on what you know to be true. And uh, a lot of times what I see is what I call milk toast Christianity. I mean, a lot of people have used that term um, where I'm just going to water everything down and not stand on anything so that I don't offend anyone. Mm -hmm. And I what I found is that if you are not offending some of the people all of the time or all of the people some of the time, <laughs> um, then you're definitely not pushing things enough. I, I've done a lot of consulting for businesses and when I come into a business is when I come into a business and I hear words that are similar to this, man, we have the best leadership team. We always get along. We never have any disagreements. We're always in alignment. We're always in agreement. We're amazing. I know for sure you're doing everything mediocre, mediocre. There's just no way you can accomplish the very best without some friction. Iron sharpens iron, right? 
it doesn't sharpen itself. Iron doesn't sharpen the other iron without hitting the other iron and rubbing up against it. That friction is absolutely required. Did you pose a question on this one? Uh, yeah, there's a few, but I would say um, that um, this particular thing, I think, it delves into starting rumors and stirring up, like people stirring up people towards another organization. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I think that this can actually happen a lot amongst our own church communities mm -hmm. where we're stirring up people against other churches yeah for sure um and that's really damaging to yeah uh, what's the point of that like there's no there's very little that can be gained by doing that but i think it's about really, a lot of competition really yes it comes down measuring it comes down measuring to something. that yeah like we a couple need guys measuring members, stuff so we need you know to you know break down and tear down somebody else but yeah. Um, so, you know, if you just kind of look around, well, who is, who's grouping together to tear us down and what is the spirit behind it? Mm -hmm. Um, why are they, do, why are they after us? And yeah, um, so I, I think what I'm hearing you say that's really important is you can't just say all opposition is from the enemy. You need to pay attention. What I think I hear you saying is you need to actually pay attention to who's opposing you and what the opposition is. It may be something you do need to change. Like it might be opposition for a reason. Mm -hmm. But in the same token, it may not be. And if it's not, then you need to deal with it swiftly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So really analyzing, uh, you know, why people are accusing you of something is, is important. And checking to see if there's, you know... Yeah. truth under that accusation because right. um, we certainly don't want there to be right. if there if it's if it's wrong right. accusation for sure you know? um so all right let's keep moving so did we already do this one yeah okay um, well let's keep moving so but another question is are we making sure that there is no room for the ugly rumors to stand and hold ground mm. oh man so that's it's so really good. important for us as um in the kingdom we're going to get rumors told about us. We're going to get the truth twisted to paint a picture that says something completely opposite yeah. or just slight yes. tainting. So it's really important that if, um, cause I feel like there's, there's different types of things that can be, um, that we're accused of. And some of that comes from within our own church communities. Yeah. For sure. And some of it is from the outside world that doesn't understand what we are doing or thinking because mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to them. Right. So they're just going to, you know. The pushback on everything, right? Yeah. Because it's foreign. So anyway, so if there's ugly rumors going around, we just need to make sure that there is no truth to keep fueling them. Yeah. So, so this whole concept of... Um, ensuring that you're above reproach kind of fits in here, right? Like, so a couple things, when the rumors happen, cause they will, no matter how perfect you think you are, people are going to start the rumors. Like this is a great example. Nehemiah is a super good example of this. He didn't do anything that warranted it yet. Here they came. So when they come a couple things that I'm drawing out of this one is you don't just ignore those. Like you, you, listen to them, you evaluate. Are these from the Lord? Is there accuracy in this? Is there something I need to do to pivot? If there's not, I don't just, I also don't just pretend like it didn't happen or there's not a rumor. I address it. Nehemiah addressed this stuff directly. He wasn't having any of it is the way mm -hmm. you wrote it, Prudence. He yeah. wasn't having any of it. Yeah. Um, so he didn't just shirk back and hope that they go away. Like the clanging symbol doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people will take silence as... Yeah, silence as is you must be guilty. Yes, yeah, silence <laughs> is admittance. Um, and in some ways, that's a reasonable thing for people to assume because if you don't say something, then what are they like? What are they supposed to? How are they supposed to interpret that? So obviously, you don't want to give weight to foolish things all the time, and especially as you develop more influence there's going to be people saying bad things. So you don't, you got to be careful to not give weight to every little complaint or whiny critic or somebody saying that you're doing something wrong because the more you gain influence, the more naysayers there are. 
But that's why it's so important to pay close attention to what's really going on so you can actually address this stuff. Yeah. Right, so anyway, um, Nehemiah was really infuriated at these guys. Um, <laughs> this he, is where he wasn't having any of it comes no, into play. No, he, he wasn't. And he, he makes note in the scripture that he understood that these loud mouths and opposition was stirring up the builders like he didn't want you mean his, the people doing he work, didn't want work? yeah he didn't want yeah. his people getting slathered with the discouragement i and love the words you use slathered with discouragement well, kind of that's what they were doing Can tell you're an author is really just smearing them with all sorts of doubts and and um possible rumors and fear like they really wanted to instill fear so uh, Nehemiah, he got up on his little podium and he... Let him have it. Well, yes, but more than that, he really asked the Lord it. to take care of him. Oof, that's even worse. And he And it's so he really... Um, uh, Nehemiah was careful to be aware of what the enemy was doing to his people. So he was he was watching that this certain people group was really starting to, to poison and sour. And he didn't want that happening to his workers. So he's really trying hard to protect uh, what, what, what they were intaking. Um, so he knew he also needed his people to be one on the project and he couldn't afford for someone to be getting all hot and bothered by the devil's deception. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when we have one person in the midst and they're just going around, going, yeah. poisoning everyone around them. Yep. It's literally like some sort of a disease mm -hmm. that starts in your community and you have to stop that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> because it will literally take it's the division in the church it just takes out people emotionally bad news. it's bad news so um so, so it's, what, what it's important nehemiah came to the opposition and threw down a curse reversal on them yeah I because like well that. Curse yeah. reversal because he was he was really like oh lord you better just take care of these guys or i'm gonna do it yes in other so words he wasn't having that we it. protect the truth in our community and make sure we are helping others see it yeah so um this is also how we should work in our family too Mm -hmm. You know, if a family member is upset about another family member, we have to help them see what lies they might be believing. Yeah. And so it's our job as community members to really help get in there and help give the truth to people, especially if there's mm -hmm. a rumor that is floating around that yeah. can cause a lot of damage or is. That's so good. So are you on, are you on yeah, this Yeah, move to six. Okay, let me just read the way that you do this. I think it's super good. Uh, the people wanted to participate and worked their fingers to the bone. For the people had a mind to work is actually what it says in four, mm -hmm. um, six. So the people had a mind to work. What that tells me, um, what, I, what I read into that is they had bought into the vision the people had a mind to work. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't threatening them. Hey, listen, we got to get this wall built or you guys are toast. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, here's the vision of what we need to do. Here's your part. Do you say yes to that part? And they bought into it. That's what I believe the people had a mind to work means. So that means you can't force people. You can't guilt them. You can't shame them. They need to be bought into the vision. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and the community was ready for that change too. Um, and they all came together and worked hard. Um, and then also, you know, a note on um, that studies show that to keep older kids in church, we must get them involved. Mm -hmm. So this is a way to pull people in and make sure that they feel a part of something. Absolutely. When we feel a part of something is when we want to stay around and hang Absolutely. around. Absolutely. And so um, really putting people in places of work and and really that their hearts are willing to do it. So here's the question that you posed, Prudence. How can we encourage people to work that aren't working? 
and how can we help each other not hold resentment towards those who are unwilling? Oh my goodness, there is so much in there. Unpack that, those two parts. So the, how do we encourage, so there's people that automatically take up their responsibility and work. Okay, we're not talking about them. Then there's people that don't. How do we help them see what their responsibility is and get them to work? And then the other part of this is when they still don't, how do we not build up resentment towards them? So what's your answer? What's my answer? Yeah, how, how, how do about you? you answer it? <laughs> how about I answer it? Yeah. Um, well, I think that in order, again, this goes back to the point above, in order to get people to work well, long-term, sustained, scalable, not just immediate, short-term, they have to be bought into the vision. You have to lead by example and they have to be bought into the vision. You can get them to work a short amount of time with threaten, threatening or shame or guilt, mm -hmm. but that only works for a short amount right. of time and resentment builds super fast. Yeah. So they have to be bought into the vision. Now, some people are actually just lazy. Okay, most people aren't. Most people, if they're bought into the vision, will contribute a lot, but some people are still lazy. So for them, you need to get them bought into the vision. They might still be lazy, and you might have to just push them. And here's the thing. If they still won't work, you might have to exit them out of the team. Because what happens is, if you don't, if you just let them slide through, then the rest of the team that is working hard will build resentment. It's almost 100% almost for sure. Like maybe one or two super mature people that can keep their mind focused perfectly won't but most people will have resentment towards the ones that aren't pulling their weight um, and then sometimes you can't do that in your environment sometimes you can't fire people because they don't work for you maybe maybe they come to your church or something you can't just fire them so then it's up to you to develop a jesus like perception of what's going on so you do, you yourself don't build resentment towards them because it's like super easy to build resentment yeah I think really returning, just really keeping your own self focused on God and um, what he's asking you to do is the best way to keep yourself from resentment and not considering yourself really the boss of somebody else. Right. Because Absolutely. if you see it as humans have to have, res they, they're responsible for themselves. Yeah, they need to be. They're responsible and, for themselves, and I'm. I can't be responsible for somebody else's. No, you can't. You can't. But here, here's here's what a lot of people will do. Especially, I see this more and more in today's culture. They actually will let you. They'll sit back and let you take their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you have. I, to. I probably won't invite them to my parties. They won't get invited to her parties. They won't get invited to my parties because I'm, I'm at her parties usually. So the thing about that is, is that culturally today, it's like a, it's a, it's a culture of, um, Hey, it's, I didn't know like, Hey, aren't you going to fix this? Hey, aren't you going to prepare this for me? Aren't you going to like, I walked off the edge of the cliff because there was no barrier. Well, why didn't you tell me kind of, um, culture where the personal responsibility is at an all time low. So you've got to recognize that you've got to be able to address that. You've got to be able to, from a leadership standpoint, work with people and you got the two groups, right? You have the people that are that way. They need teaching. And then you have the people that aren't like that and you need to help them not have resentment against these guys. So it's super, super important that you balance both of these. So Okay, we are out of time for this first part of this. We're going to try to tackle the rest of this. Um, I mean, probably episode. may need two more episodes because we're not that far. But this is absolutely worth it. So this is going to be a three-part. Um, this is the first part of a three-part series. It's absolutely fantastic digging into Nehemiah. I love it. We will see you guys on the next one.